All right, welcome back to CS4510. Uh, let's talk about uh, what's going on. This second half, this is CS4510. Uh, I think it's L12B. The topic is the halting problem. So we just did a little course on logic. We proved that no axiomatic system can be both consistent and complete in a sort of dramatic fashion. Ending the dream of many. Um, Hilbert had one problem left over, uh, which is called, I'm going to butcher this, the Entschei, anyone German? Entschei Dung, Dung's problem, which basically means decision problem. We'll call this Hilbert's decision problem. Now, it has a very technical statement, and it can be reformulated in many ways. Uh, one of them is give a procedure to determine the truth value of any formula. So you want, he was asking for a procedure in order to uh, determine if, if any formula can be uh, is either true or false. And again, a formula is one with no free variables, so it of course must be assigned to truth value. Give a procedure to determine the truth value of any formula. Now, that's kind of important because expressing a formula within the system is very different than proving the formula within the system, right? For example, for Matt's little theorem, we could say um, for all n, uh, there exists uh, x, y, and z such that. Uh, 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 n is greater than or equal to 3, uh, and, uh, and uh, x to the n plus y to the n is equal to z to the n, right? That's a uh, well-formed formula over the symbols of whatever formal system you're using. It has no free variables. Each one is bound. Yet how do you determine if it's true, if this formula is true or false? If you had a procedure which could do such a thing, uh, mathematics could be well mechanized because you would simply take this formula, plug it in, and out would out, it would output it true or false. Maybe perhaps it would even output a proof that such, such, such a statement is true or false. And this is an example for Matt's last theorem, which went unproved for like 350 years or whatever. And only in 1994 did it become proved, right? So such a procedure is asking a lot, in fact. Um, because you can formalize basically any, any uh, uh, conjecture in the formal language, right? It, this would solve every mathematical problem. Alan Turing basically says no. He's, he, he says such a procedure cannot exist. Um, and so what does he do? Uh, and again, this is sort of the end of our arc. This is a, a program in history which went from 300 BC all the way to Alan Turing in 1936. So here's basically how it happened. Uh, Alan Turing goes to a lecture. And he learns about Gödel's incompleteness theorem. He takes like a special topics class or something under Paul Bernays. And he learns about the incompleteness theorem. He learns about Hilbert's program. He learns about this unshy dunch problem. And um, then he goes and he has a little bit of money and he sits at home and he does the following three acts. First, um, what did I say he did? Make sure I got this in order. Uh, first, Alan Turing invents the Turing machine. Great. Two, he invents the Church Turing thesis. So he gave a formalization of the concept of algorithm. Then he gave, was as close of a thing that you can call a proof the church Turing thesis, a correspondence between the intuitive concept of a procedure, as one as Hilbert is asking for, and a formal concept, uh, the Turing machine. So reasoning about the Turing machine will allow you to reason about the informal concept, including the non-existence of one for the problem that Hilbert wants. Three, he invents a definition of algorithm. Today we say the definition of algorithm is going to be this class of languages. L is an element of LTM uh, if 
uh, there exists a Turing machine, which we'll say we'll call it Turing machine M, which I'll stress this twice halts on all inputs so that uh, W is an L if and only if M on W accepts halts it accepts. And that W is not an element of L if and only if M and W halts and rejects. Very important right now uh, is that the definition of algorithm is ones that have Turing machines to decide them. Not only does do the Turing machines decide the languages, but the Turing machine is one which halts on all of its inputs. That is the definition we will use of an algorithm. Think about it for a second if you have an algorithm, quote unquote. If you have a piece of, a piece of code that on a certain input diverges, it doesn't say, it just loops forever. Is that an algorithm to solve the problem? Mm. Let's, for now, consider our definition of algorithm to be one which halts on all inputs, strongly so. Right. Qualms or questions about this one? This is, again, just the definition of what it means for a language to be decidable. So then Alan Turing provides two uh, proofs. He does. Two arguments. The first is non-constructive. Um, uh, first, let uh, let TM be the set of Turing machines uh, let uh, LTM be the decidable languages. Consider the subset, I don't know, we'll call it D for decider of LTM, which are Turing machines which halt on all inputs. Uh, first thing we observe, what is the cardinality of D? The deciders. D is a set of Turing machines which halt on all inputs. What is the cardinality of D? The natural numbers. Natural numbers. D is countable. Yes. Why? Because they can be described uh, so perfectly. Perfect. Perfect. Every Turing machine has a string description, so there are countably many of them. Perfect. Typewriter principle. Um, uh, there exists a bijection uh, from D to uh, the set of decidable languages. It may not be the obvious one, because one language may be decided by many deciders, but every decider decides exactly one language, right? So, but I still claim that there is such a bijection. Perhaps I'll leave it to you to figure out what it is. One decider decides exactly one language. Every, some language may be decidable by multiple deciders. So certainly, this is, let's not even say it's decidable, let's say it's onto, right? Um, let's consider it the other way. Consider the mapping of a language to the machines which decide it. Now, one machine may be decided by multiple languages, so this is not even a function. So restrict it to the smallest lexicographic machine which decides that language. This is then an injection. right? Either way, we get that the cardinality of LTM must be what? So, so, like, most languages cannot be decided. That's exactly what we're going to prove. Oh. Yes. That's the first argument, the non-constructive argument. Uh, sigma star is countable by Cantor's theorem. The 
power set of sigma star is uncountable. So we know that um, the decidable languages are not only are a strict subset of all possible languages, in a huge infinite sense, there are infinitely many more languages, there are many more problems than there are solutions to those problems. The set, of, the set of problems that have solutions, in some sense, is infinitely smaller than the set of total problems. So simply, there must exist some elements in there that have no algorithm to do them. So there exists unsolvable problems. By a simple counting, argue, ar counting argument, way more problems than solutions, so there must be solutions. There must be problems without solutions. Right? First, uh, proof by Alan Turing. Perhaps even th a, throwaway a throwaway remark. Right? Many more problems than solutions. Can't do it. Non-constructively so. Right? This is important in the formalization of the Church-Turing thesis, if you think about it, because the definition, of, when you take a scientific theory, you get to do this like explanatory power. The Church-Turing thesis says the Turing machine is great. Importantly, in that proof, though, you can also extend it and say, well, the Turing machine is a finitely describable, so the set of such descriptions of machines must be countable. So there must be only countably many problems which can be solved. Right? Now imagine the church Turing thesis said something about a, the definition of an algorithm being uh, some un objects of an uncountable set. That may change. But importantly is, the, is that the fact that the problems we can solve must come from a countable set. The same way that the real numbers which have names is countable. Right? Questions on this proof? Sort of a, perhaps you could rediscover this one, I think. The second proof is far more important, and he is not satisfied with this. He gives a constructive problem, which is uh, unsolved. It's called the halting problem. Uh, let halt be a language. Halt is a, a language which contains pairs of descriptions of machines and words, such that the machine halts on the word. Essentially, what this is is that, again, machines are machines. They have codes. So take the code of the machine and append to it, with some sort of delimiter, uh, a word. And then that's the strings that are in halt. If m halts on w, that is a string that is in this language. Now, Alan Turing originally used, uh, you won't believe this, Gödel numberings. He, everything had to be done on the descriptions of the machines. Again, we, we played around, if you notice, with the description of a formula and the formula itself. We, we ran, the, uh, ran, we, we uh, evaluated the formula at its own numbering. Here we'll end up doing the same thing. With the interplay between the description of an object and the object itself, we'll be able to construct a similar proof to Gödel's incompleteness there. Right? A machine has code and yet also can take us input code. Right? Nothing too controversial yet. Uh, we will prove that halt is an undecidable language. In some sense, halt as a language is not an element of LTM. Questions on the setup of the proof before we get into it? What is we understand what this language is saying? What the elements of this language are? How does every proof like this go? Perhaps by necessity, these kinds of proofs are usually proofs by contradiction, because how would you do such things? How would you prove the non-existence of something constructively? It's not quite obvious. So we would say, assume to the contrary. Contrary. Halt is decidable with decider h. Assume to the contrary, halt is decidable and has a decider for it, h. So there exists an algorithm, h, which takes as input the code of a code of a machine and a word, and outputs a yes or no. We will represent halt here, perhaps, as a block diagram. As assuming to the contrary that halt exists, that excuse me, h exists, h decides halt. This is a program that always halts on all of its inputs. We will construct the following program d. D on input. Doesn't really matter. Uh, let's say uh, d on input uh, x will pipe its input to the, both of the inputs of h. And then if halt says no, it's going to immediately return. And if halt says yes, it's going to infinitely loop. 
Because H exists, D exists. D is just code. Here's what D looks like. Uh, D, I don't know, if we were to do Pythonically, we'd say def D on input X. Um, we'll even say on input, uh, yeah, on input X. Uh, if H of XX uh, loop, else return. Right? Or we'll say even else halt. halt. H is some root subroutine, okay? We're going to use, H assumes to the contrary it exists. We're just going to use it as a subroutine in construction of D. Now, H halts on all inputs. D perhaps doesn't. It has an infinite loop coded into it, right? But we know that whatever input runs will get to one of these two steps. Right. Question so far on the construction. D is just code, right? So we have some Turing machine. Uh, take the Turing machine and run it on its own code. Uh, what is a D on input D? So we're going to take the Turing machine D and run it on the description of the Turing machine D. So we're going to take a machine and run it on its own, uh, its own code. Well, every machine either halts on an input or it loops. It gets stuck in an infinite loop on an input. One of those two cases must be true. If, uh, we'll say like this, uh, case one. Uh, D on input D uh, halts. If D on input D halts, that means this wire was reached. Let's trace it back, and we see that H uh, said no. So we know uh, then that means that H on input uh, D of D rejected. Right? But that means that uh, then D must get stuck in a loop on D. Violating the correctness of the assumed to the contrary decider H. OK, so if D on its own code halts, that could only happen if and only if D on input its own code loops. Mm, not looking good for us. Let's try case two, D on input D. Uh, loops. If D gets stuck in a loop, uh, then what happens? Well, the only place the loop, because H is a decider, no loops exist in here. There's only one place an infinite loop can occur. It could be yes. So if D on input D loops, we know that implies uh, that H on input uh, D comma D uh, accepts. But H on input D comma D accepts if D on input D accepts, or excuse me, not accepts, halts. It's a halting decider, halts. Also a contradiction. So we see in both cases that D on its own code halts if and only if D on its own code loops. Right? This is called the halting problem. Contradiction, halt as a language has no decider. Questions on the halting problem? Perhaps you've seen this, some other scenario, right? So again, uh, you know, Hilbert had this program. He wanted to show the completeness and consistency of all logic. But another point of detail was the, the dis of decidability. He wanted the ability to me mechanize mathematics to prove that there exists an algorithm which can just prove every statement for you if you could formalize it. But here we see that there exist unsolvable problems. Alan Turing proves that the halt, language halt is undecidable. There does not exist an algorithm which takes as input a machine in a word and will always output true or false if that machine halts or not. Right. Again, I want to emphasize the importance of the church string thesis here. Imagine you came up, you tried to come up with your own church string thesis and you constructed some sort of computational model in which it was functional, perhaps, and every machine halted on every input or something. Like you just were only able to describe devices which always finished or terminated, you would only have an, you would have something like an incomplete theory of computation in some sense, right? It wouldn't be perfect. You couldn't do you couldn't never do such a thing. But importantly here is the fact that Turing machines are allowed to loop, and then determining if a Turing machine loops is unsolvable. You cannot ever determine if a machine loops or not, right? What's the proof technique used here? 
its diagonalization. Why? This one we can give a little more uh, explan explanation why. Assume to the, uh, well, not assume to the contrary. Suppose we lined up the machines here, M1, M2, M3, and we lined up strings here of the descriptions of the machines. Right? If you ran the machine on its own code, consider all possible machines ran on their own code. Let's say we put a halt here, and we say we put a loop here, and say we put a halt here. We put a halt here, something like this, right? We can fill in a two-dimensional table in such a way. If H exists, then D exists, and therefore you can put D somewhere here, and the code of D somewhere here. And then what happens at this, at this uh, element, right? It's again on the diagonal of a machine running its own code. So we see that, the, again, the technique used here is diagonalization. Diagonalization was used immediately by Cantor, diagonalized out of sets to prove uh, unco uncountable sets exist. You can diagonalize out of. Uh, Russell used it for um, to show uh, with unrestricted comprehension. You can cons con consider this set of all sets which do not contain themselves. Uh, Godel used it to evaluate a predicate on its own Godel numbering. And here we see Alan Turing running a computer program on its own code. It's the same stuff. We still have self reference and we still have a negated self reference. It's still the same technique, in fact. Right? The, ins the, the inspiration from Godel incompleteness is quite obvious. It's almost the same thing that comes up. Really, the great contribution by Turing, not necessarily is this diagonal proof, because if, once you have a definition of a Turing machine, perhaps you could figure that out, but is rather the church Turing thesis. The fact that he invented a formal model to diagonalize over is what his real great contribution is in this paper. Right? Questions on this so far? In fact, the concept of incompleteness and the concept of undecidability are, in fact, related. They're basically the same. We can prove it now. Um, there is a complete and consistent uh, formal system of sufficient arithmetic, arithmetic, if and only if halt is decidable. Because halt is undecidable, this direction is vacuous. So we won't need to prove that way. Let's prove the other way. Let's suppose that there exists a complete and consistent formal system. It is both complete and is consistent, and it has sufficient arithmetic, whatever that entails uh, with respect to Godel incompleteness. We will give a decider for halt as follows. So, and you could perhaps take this as a proof by contradiction of Godel incompleteness. And we'll phrase it that way. Assume to the contrary, such a system exists. We give a decider for halt. And again, halt is the, uh, the set of encodings of machines and words such that the machine halts on that word. Uh, here's the decider as follows. H on input um, uh, M and W. We want H to be a decider. It's going to return true or false, right? Uh, build a formula phi on, from M and W with some free variables X. 
And now here's the part that sufficient comes, uh, arithmetic comes, comes with. A uh, phi of m comma w of x is true uh, if m halts on w and phi on input m comma w of x is false if m loops on w. Okay, This construction can be done. And in fact, this is where the sufficient arithmetic comes into play. It's just some multiplication and some addition, and you do something really complicated. The x, in some sense, is really just the sequence of, it's the sequence of steps the machine takes. So you can find, of the free variables, that. Uh, and if those exist, then it's true. If they don't exist, then it's false. Right? You just quantify over it. Um, so you build such a formula to be true if, and only if, m halts on w. Um, now that we have a formula that is true if and only if a machine halts, we simply are going to brute force search for a proof of, the, of this formula. So we have uh, for uh, w, I'll say p in sigma star lexicographically. This is an infinite for loop. Basically what happens is it's going to be p is going to be in 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? It's going to, there's going to be a loop over an infinite set. Um, if p is a proof of uh, 5mw, except what this is really doing is we are looping over the natural numbers and seeing if p demonstrates the encoding of the formula 5mw, right? If p is a proof of the negation of uh, 5mw, reject. So what are we going to do? We're going to brute force search for all strings, see if they are a proof that m halts on w. And if, they, if it is a proof that m halts on w, we uh, accept. If it's a proof that m does not halt on w, we reject. Uh, since we are uh, complete, and since m either uh, halts on w or loops on w, there must exist a p, which is a proof of it. So this loop always terminates. And H is a decider. This is an infinite for loop. By completeness, such a P must exist. Because the loop is total, such a P will always be found. Right? Therefore, this for loop always terminates. And therefore, so does this whole algorithm. H is therefore a decider for halt. But this is a contradiction. This is, in fact, a, sh a similar proof. This is a proof uh, of Gödel incompleteness, right? We can prove, we assume to the contrary, that we are in a system which is su sufficient arithmetic, complete and consistent. But if such a system were to exist, we would be able to give an algorithm for halt. Contradiction, no such algorithm for halt can exist. Right? It elucidates less than the proof that Gödel gave, but it's much shorter and much simpler. Right? Simply relying on the undecidability of the halting problem. Questions on this? All right, I have one more thing, uh, which is that you may have noticed that certain machines loop on inputs. And you may question yourself, you know, isn't the description of an algorithm perhaps too rigid? We are requiring our, de our definition of an algorithm to be those which have Turing machines uh, which halt on them. A language is decidable if it uh, halts on all inputs. But perhaps this is too stringent of a, a requirement. 
consider the fact that you can at least half decide halt. Uh, consider the following algorithm. Let's call it, I don't know, R on input uh, m comma w. Uh, R is going to simulate uh, m on w. If m accepts, R accepts. So um, uh, if m comma w is in is in halt, uh, that's that's true that R on m comma w uh, accepts. It halts and accepts, right? But if m is comma w is not an element of halt, then what happens to r? Doesn't halt. Yeah, the simulator gets stuck in an infinite loop. So what you're going to do here is you just run the machine on w. If it accepts, great. If it doesn't, well, I mean, too bad. You're stuck in an infinite loop. This is not a decider for halt. This is at least half a decider for halt, though. So motivating that, let's give a definition of a larger class of languages. We say L is an element of L star uh, TM. And these are called several things. They're called the recognizable languages. These are called the recursively enumerable languages. These are called the computably enumerable languages. These are called the listable languages. These are called, um, there's like 10 names for, this, for the same object. I'm going to try to stick with the word recognizable. A language is recognizable if w is an L, if and only if uh, m on w halts and accepts, but we allow this if w is not an L. We allow the m on w to halt and, ex halt, uh, and reject or loop. So if w is an L, it has to say yes. If w is not an L, then it can say no, or it's allowed to get stuck in an infinite loop. Right? This is a generalization of the definition of a decidable languages. Sometimes these are also called semi-decidable languages. right? So in fact, we can see immediately, because halt is not decidable, halt is undecidable, but halt is recognizable by the fact that we built a, a recognizer for it, we see that this is a strictly stronger class than LTM. Right? So we have generalized, a, we have a weaker definition of what algorithm is. And we were able to show that halt uh, has this semi-decider. It has a weaker notion of algorithm for it, right? Who's to say that maybe we chose the wrong definition of algorithm and we were too stringent? And who's to say that there really are no undecidable problems? Let's prove that it, this, the undecidability does not really matter of which definition of algorithm you use. Suppose, uh, who's to say it's not the case that every algorithm is not also recognizable, right? So let's prove that not every problem is also recognizable. It is true, in fact, that every language, now, that, now we're allowing algorithms which get stuck on in an infinite loop, we can do some interesting things. First off, consider the machine uh, m on input uh, w to just loop. What language does this machine recognize? Empty set. The empty set. In fact, this machine recognizes a regular language. So there may be some set of equivalent machines that, d that recognize the same language, and that language happens to be decidable. So the fact that a machine loops does not mean it doesn't decide a non-decidable language. You know? So there's already some uh, things we have to go on with this. Um, second is, why is? L star TM than not every language, right? The first argument is the same counting argument. Well, this is still countable, right? Why, instead of considering a subset of the Turing machines which halt on all inputs, we can simply consider every Turing machine. Because in fact, every Turing machine 
recognizes some language, all of them. There's a perfect bijection, in fact. The definition is that the machine recognizes the language, right? Actually, there's not a perfect bijection, as we see from the previous example. That language is, in fact, regular. But either way, we know that L star TM is still countable. So there's certainly there are elements of uh, uh, there are still problems which cannot be solved because there's still only countably many Turing machines. Right? The second thing is, OK, fine. Is there a problem which you can define at least? Can you give me a set builder notation of a problem which does not have a machine to recognize it? Once we prove that, then it should be sufficient to conclude that still, yes, there are. Even if there are, there may be undecidable problems, sure. But not only that, there's still even unrecognizable problems. So we'll prove two things. First, two little lemmas, and we'll be able to take the existence of an unrecognizable problem as algebra. We prove that the, the decidable languages are closed under complement. What's the proof? The decidable languages are closed under complement. Every fault and reject, swap it with the fault and accept. Control F, find, replace, return true with return false. Suppose M decides some language. Build M bar to decide the complement of the language. QED. Simple proof, right? Any decider for a language, there exists a decider for the complement. OK. So we know that the decidable <coughs> languages are closed under complement. Here's a second theorem, which is slightly more tedious. If L and L complement are recognizable, oh, where am I putting my star? Whatever. Then, uh, L is decidable. If a language and its complement both have recognizers, then the language is decidable. There exists an algorithm that halts in all inputs for the language. Here's how the, dis the construction of the decider works. I'll call the recognizer for machine R to be, for language to be R, and we'll call the recognizer to be R complement. We'll call the machine D, because D is a decider. We know R is a recognizer for L. So if W is an L, we know R accepts. Right? If uh, W is not an L, W is an element of L complement. So R bar W accepts. So our decider D is going to take the two recognizers for L and L complement. It's going to run them. And then it's going to accept if R accepts. And it's going to reject if R bar rejects. R bar accepts, excuse me. When you have a recognizer, this little reject wire is kind of useless because the machine is allowed to infinitely loop. If it's in the input, this one will always light up. But only sometimes will it reject, right? So we'll take the good parts. Here's a sentence that needs to be said. How does the machine simulate two machines simultaneously? What if R bar gets stuck in an infinite loop? Uh, what do you do? The trick is that you dovetail the simulations. You run the machines one at a time. You write a little bit of this machine. You see what it did. It did, made a step. You do it like 10 steps. OK, you run this one for 10 steps. You run that one for 10 steps. You run that for one, 10 steps. This is a decider because L, W is either in L or it's an L complement. And even if one gets stuck in an infinite loop, the other must accept or reject it. So we see that D is a decider. Great, we've proven two useful theorems that the decidable languages are closed under complement, and that if, two lang if a language and its complement are recognizable, the language is also decidable. Okay? We can use this to prove that a language is unrecognizable through a simple argument. 
Um, what's an unrecognizable language? Let's see if we can jump to the next step. No guesses? Let's do it. Uh, halt complement is unrecognizable. There does not even exist a semi-decider for this language. There isn't even a half thing that can do this language, right? We gave a decider, excuse me, a recognizer for halt. It was at least right on the good inputs. There doesn't even exist a machine for halt complement. Proof, uh, suppose not, assume to the contrary not. So halt uh, and halt complement are recognizable. Well, that implies that halt is decidable. Contradiction. Because, because halt is recognizable and not decidable, halt is uh, halt complement cannot even be recognizable. For if it were recognizable with halt being recognizable, then you may dovetail the simulations of both of those recognizers and congrats, you build a decider for halt, but no such decider can exist. QED. So we see even our definition of algorithm is not that good, right? I mean, excuse me. Even if you change the definition of algorithm to be super reliant, and I don't agree with the fact that anyone should consider a language being recognizable as one that has a decider for it, excuse me, being has an algorithm. The definition of algorithm ought to be one that has a machine that halts on all inputs. That's what an algorithm should be, right? So even if you were so relaxed and so general to allow something like this, which you shouldn't, even then there exist undecidable problems to you, unrecognizable languages, right? Halt complement is unrecognizable. Further questions? Awesome.